good afternoon, and they told me to stand straight, stay right here so they could film me. I tend to wander around. This is a, and uh, Jack, thank you for your nice words. I'll reimburse you for that money you put up here later. Uh, no. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and I'm, uh, I picked a topic that I thought uh, hopefully interesting to you all, maybe somewhat disturbing. As you know, I live and li my business is not one that's uh, very uh, optimistic. It's one of, uh, of uh, violence, addiction, death, uh, theft, uh, rape, pornography, obscenity, uh, and then there's the good day days, but uh, I listened to um, TV the other yesterday, day before yesterday, when I was, I was, I had one topic picked out, and Judge Goodwin told me what his topic was going to be, so I changed my topic, but um, I heard on the radio that a new poll had come out, national poll, that after inflation, the next biggest concern of the people of the United States is crime, <clears throat> and I think that's uh, it's in the headlines every day. You see officers killed. You see people getting out on low bonds and going out and killing people by knives, pushing them over into subways, stabbing people in businesses, uh, running cars through traffic. Uh, it's in the headlines every day. And I can tell you that violent crime has, impro has increased all over the country, uh, not only in the big cities, but I here in Sullivan County. And um, so we're going to talk about crime. And we're going to start talking about crimes and drugs. But before we do, I want you to know something about me. I'm not woke. I'm not a progressive prosecutor. I believe in following the law as it's written. I have taken an oath to follow the law in Tennessee, and I will. And I hope to do it fairly. And my, I feel that my main duty is to protect you, this public, here in Sullivan County. And that's the goal of all my assistants in my office. And I want to tell you that I believe that punishment is a, is a proper reason uh, within the criminal justice system uh, that it is a, it's a way to obtain rehabilitation. But I think punishment is a uh, proper goal for our office. People need to put away in jail to do bad things. And I think that it's part of, uh, and I do believe in rehabilitation. Uh, but I think sometimes rehabilitation has to take place after someone's incarcerated. I think sometimes a recognition and accountability are necessary to properly uh, rehabilitate people. And I will tell you the reason um, I think rehabilitation is important because uh, I am a sponsor and I am an advocate for this at regional rehabilitation facility up in Carter County that we're trying to get. And I will tell you that even though I'm a traditional uh, what I think law and order prosecutor, I also believe in innovation. And I have, for example, we have a family justice center here in Sullivan County, the Branch House. About 40% of our cases are domestic violence in our county. And they take a tremendous amount of resources. Uh, and uh, there are many women that uh, are in a cycle of violence and their children can't get The Branch House is an opportunity to do that. That's, we have 45, I think, partner agencies we provide all kinds of services for abused women, men, and children, and elderly and vulnerable. Uh, also, um, we have uh, attempted to make a paperless system in our office. I know that's not exciting, but uh, we've tried to, we are one of the pilot programs in the state to uh, convert our paperwork to a paperless system. We are also a pilot program. We have one of the only three uh, agencies across the state that work overdose deaths. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. We have uh, a, an overdose task force that combines the drug, the DTF, the drug task force of Sullivan County, with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. And what we try to do is solve overdose cases, and we have a tremendous amount. And we, there are hybrid cases. They have to be worked as murders and as drug cases, because if you furnish Schedule One or two drugs to someone, they die. That is murder in Tennessee. And third, I filed the lawsuit that I filed. And I filed it under what's called the Drug Dealers Liability Act. And what it says is that the DAs can file a lawsuit, and if they can prove that someone facilitated an illegal drug market, they can be held financially responsible. And when I took under this lawsuit, it had never been tested. It had been, it had been created for drug cartels that had assets. 
But I went after a, a business, businesses. And a lot of people said, well, you know, they're, uh, they're licensed by the federal government. They sell a legal a product to it's approved by the FDA. It's uh, dispensed by pharmacists and doctors to people that consent to take it. But what we found out, these drugs were marketed as something they were not. The companies knew that uh, what they were saying was not true, they were addictive, and they, didn't, they weren't as um, efficient and, as they claimed they were. And they knew that they were dispensing and selling drugs way beyond anything that would be medically justifiable. And we found that out during, the, in, during our trial, pre-trial, as we got closer to trial, as uh, they tried to prevent us from getting that information, but we were able to get it. And I filed under this lawsuit because I wanted this money to come straight to Sullivan County without any strings attached. I did not want the Attorney General to have that money in Nashville. Some of you all are old enough to remember the tobacco settlement. About almost none of that money went for tobacco education and prevention. It all went to, the, to Nashville and stayed there to balance the budget. I didn't want the Attorney General to have our money. I didn't want somebody in Nashville telling us what we could do with our money and how much we could get. So we got this money. And, sec and also, I did not want to get a settlement that went over 18 years. I wanted the money up front where we could get it and we could start using it. And that's one of the things that you're going to hear about Judge Goodwin when he's here. You're going to hear about what we envision, what we can do with this money to try to make a really effective rehabilitation for all those people that are addicted to drugs, to try to make our community better. And the good thing is, I've, here in Sullivan County, we have a tremendous support for it. So with that, let's talk a little bit more about drugs. And many of you may have seen the Meth Mountain uh, episodes or uh, the multi-part uh, stories in the Kingsport paper, I think it was the start of the day after Christmas and went throughout the week. Meth Mountain was, uh, th that term came up because uh, the vice officers told me that so many people were coming to Sullivan County to, to buy drugs, meth in, in Atlanta, that the, the dealers, when they saw a Sullivan County tag, they referred to Sullivan County as Meth Mountain. And I thought the articles that they produced were very good. They got a perspective from prosecutors, police officers, public defenders, uh, medical professionals, rehabilitation professionals. But one thing's clear, we had a huge problem, and that's what they called it, a mountain of problems. Even the editor said this was ugly, it was, not, it was complex and not easy to fix. And I want to tell you that the problems that we have here in this county are not easy to fix. For example, what's going on nationwide is happening here. For the first time, overdose deaths were over 100,000 in the United States. And uh, connected to that are homicides. Many of the drug deaths are homicides. So we not only we have an increase in violent crimes and overdoses, we're having an increase in homicides. I can tell you the last two years, and I've been practicing in, in, uh, as a prosecutor since around 1995, in the last two and a half years, we have had more murders than I can remember. And I will tell you that here in Kingsport, you may have seen uh, Chief Fields came out. It seems like every day that there is a drive-by shooting, and these are gangs. Recently, we've had cases where all people involved in the, in, in the prosecution, none of them are from Kingsport. And uh, it makes Kingsport dangerous, though Kingsport's still a great place to live. But it tells you that this problem is happening nationwide. We're not... We are not, uh, we've not escaped it. We're part of it. And we're fighting hard, so it's the police department to rid our uh, community of gang drug dealers from outside. And one of the problems nationally that we have that affects us locally is that when you have no border, and you have no border security, drugs pour into this country. And the top three drugs that we're dealing with are one is meth, meth, which used to be made at home. It's not anymore. It's made in Mexico and brought a court across the, this, the border. And I will tell you that, uh, that it's cheaper and it's more dangerous than ever. And it's more plentiful. And there's such a market for it. The other one is heroin. Heroin uh, is more powerful and it is uh, cheaper than ever. And it comes across the border. And it's usually brought by gangs from Atlanta. Uh, Detroit and New York. 
But our biggest new problem is fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid. It's 100 times stronger than oxycodone and oxycontin and heroin. And we're getting flooded with it. And it's made in China. And I have to always remind people with the Olympics here, China doesn't always have our best interest. And that might be a surprise to you that they really don't care, care how many people they kill over here. But they're selling lots, they're producing a lot of fentanyl and it's being brought into this country. And what, and the reason we're seeing such an uptick of overdoses is because drug dealers are now are buying pill presses. Somebody thinks they're buying oxycodone or Xanax or Tab, but inside of it's fentanyl. And so they buy that drug and then they die. And we're going to talk about the statistics here. These are the drug overdoses in 2017. Last year was a record year. We had 56 drug overdoses, fatal drug overdoses in all of Sullivan County. And we estimate that for every fatal drug overdose, there's probably 10 to 12 non-fatal. And we also know that the, this numbers are unreported. So last year we were about averaging a little over one overdose per week with 56. In October we have 53. I'm waiting for the last autopsies from 2021, from 2021. And we'll probably get the rest of those at the end of the month. There's always a lag time between when a body's taken for an autopsy and I get the report. But I'm estimating we're gonna have over 75 this year. So we're gonna have maybe, we're gonna bump up to a week and a 1.5 per week that we know of. And it used to be it was meth or now it's overall fentanyl. And I will tell you that it is not just drug addicts, the people that we see in the criminal justice system regularly. I see young people, I see old people, I see wealthy people, I see poor people, I see middle class people. Now predominantly it is lower class, but I will tell you it is cut across the spectrum. And a matter of fact, before I came here today, I looked at, uh, they, sh they sent me four new to autopsy reports, and I review each one of those e every time they come. And three of those four were drug overdoses. There was a lady 59 years old, a woman 39 years old, and a man 31 years old. And that's the other day, it's really, I think, a disturbing trend. More and more women are dying. And uh, so we have that drug overdose task force. Every time we get a reported death, we go to the scene, we try to find out where they got the drugs and investigate that case. One, to find, go up the, the chain to find out who's providing these dangerous drugs out in the community. But secondly, we're trying to find who provided the drugs for a homicide case. And why do we do that? How else are we gonna deter the problem unless people are held accountable? That's why I said as a prosecutor, I believe in accountability that we have to hold these people accountable, and we also have to deter criminal behavior. And this is an example. This young man, it was from North Carolina, but he was found in a motel here in Kingsport, dead. Young man, handsome young man. And the reason I picked this out was because the, these parents, I felt like in a poignant way, set it out, really set out the real damage that overdose drugs are. You know, we, I've read statistically that uh, the life expectancy of Americans is going down, largely in part because of drug overdoses. How, do we, how does Kingsport become a better community? How does this country become a better country if some of our youngest people die, you know, too young, before they can fulfill their dreams? And with drugs so rampant and so prevalent in our communities, the chances of your child or your grandchild encountering drugs is great. You hope that you raise them in such a way they won't do it. But peer pressure and experimentation, it's not like smoking pot 20 years ago. I mean, these drugs, you take it one time, it might be the last time you take the drug. And this young man, if you'll turn back, Robin, I want to go, I want to read a few portions here. If you'll go back to the front page. What she says, Patrick was a naturally gifted person, smart, compassionate, funny, athletic, handsome, and was an infectious personality to be around. And then there were drugs. Patrick was killed by a long and hard fought battle with opioid addiction. 
What happened to him, he had gone to a place and rehabbed and got clean. And then he fell back into drugs. And once, you know, there's a tolerance. We see this a lot. People get clean and they go back and take the drug. And then they die. They're more susceptible to death. And one of the other things on the prior slide that was already pulled up there is that not only is it the death and the tragedy of loss of, of young lives or old lives or any lives, but the, the cost of overdoses go way beyond that. I mean, if you're a dollar and cents person, um, it, it is taxing our hospitals, our mar emergency responders, our police officers, our court system, and also the danger of fentanyl. Fentanyl, just the touch of it, can kill you. It's so powerful. So every time an EMS officer uh, uh, reports to a drug overdose scene, it's possible that they're endangering their own life. And every time an officer goes out, and every time they collect the evidence, matter of fact, the drug, the TBI has special instructions for packaging and collecting fentanyl, because if it's pack, if it's picked up the wrong, it can, it can be fatal. So it's taxing. Not, I mean, it's not. I mean, it, I guess enough of, of the death is enough, but on top of that is the financial cost and the burdens it's putting upon our system. But overall, it's the cost it's putting on our community. I mean, a community means a network of people that care and hopefully together improve and nurture one another. And I didn't even bring a slide about the children that are born on drugs. Northeast Tennessee probably leads the country in babies born on drugs. And how do we know they're born on drugs? We, we don't even know all the babies that are born on drugs. But the babies that are born on hard drugs, when, when a mother delivers, they do tests, and what we're detecting are the children that we detect have drugs in their system, have, been, have had those drugs put in their system within 24 to 48 hours. We're not talking about people that smoked pot six months ago or took a pill three months into pregnancy. We're talking about people that on the cusp of birth take hard drugs and have a baby in their womb, and that baby either has two sensations at birth. That is, they're high, or they're going through withdrawal. We've actually had cases where women literally walked in the parking lot after smoking meth or injecting drugs in their system and walked in and delivered a baby. And most of those kids don't have prenatal care. They don't have a mother who's got good judgment. They have a mother that probably comes from a very dysfunctional background to do that. And you think about what are gonna be the cost of raising that child? Is that mother gonna be in a place where she can raise that child? More than not, likely not. What, what problems would that child have? Uh, intellectually, physically, emotionally, developmentally, and the school's gonna have to handle that. And some of those things won't, may, may not pop up for years. But we're gonna have to pay the cost of that. And how do you undo what that child has suffered at birth? I mean, there's no magic wand for that. But that's what the overdose problem is doing. And many of these, and some of these babies die. And that contributes to our homicide problem. So I wanted to talk about drugs and crime. 90% of all our crime, probably in Sullivan County, is related to drugs one way or the other. And you say, how's that? Well, it's not just people that sell drugs and buy drugs and possess drugs and use drugs and have paraphernalia. We have robberies where people rob pharmacies and don't even ask for the money. They want the pills. Most of our vehicle homicides now are people that are dip, pilled up when they drive a car under the influence of the drugs and kill somebody. Most of our thefts, burglaries, are people that are needing money or goods to fence for drugs. The security folks, that the, the loss prevention people at Walmart down here, on, uh, in here in Kingsport will tell you that over for one store alone, about a half a million dollars per year is lost from shoplifting. And most of these people are drug addicts. Almost every burglary, aggravated burglary, identity theft, are people stealing credit cards for the purpose of getting drugs. Most of our elder abuse is connected to people that are supposed to be caretaking for grandmother. Drop back, and we're not there yet, but that's okay. Most of um, 
the, the folks that take care of the elderly, when we investigate elder abuse, it's financial. They steal the money, the credit card from grandma or mom for drugs, or they neglect mom, and we find them in terrible shape, sometimes close to death or at death because of that. And when it comes to um, child abuse, often it's because the, drug, the parents are junkies. They're not taking care of the kids. The kids are under malnutrition. They're not getting to the doctor. They're not getting to the schools. So almost every crime in some ways connected to drugs. The only exception to that are child molesters. And that's because they need to be sober because they spend every living moment trying to figure out a way to manipulate a child or, or, and get themselves into a trust relationship where they can molest a child. But everything else are people, I mean, and our murders, our, our domestic assaults, are people that are high on drugs. So now I want to talk about crime and punishment. And this might be a real eye-opening topic for you. Next slide. The governor last year, Governor Lee, put together a couple packages of, quote, criminal reform. And I want to tell you a little bit about it because I found that the public doesn't know a lot about the reform efforts by the governor. One is called Alternatives to Incarceration. And basically what it does, it's a system that gives the person on probation more bites of the apple before a violation, what we call a violation warrant, to put them before the judge to go to jail happens. Matter of fact, a judge is prohibited from revoking supervision for somebody who commits a technical violation. A technical violation means somebody doesn't get a job, they don't, get, they don't come and take a drug test, they fail a drug test, they don't do their community service, so they don't show up. Now the law says the judge cannot revoke their probation. He can give them 15, 30, or 90 days. Where he used to be, Judge Goodwin, for example, would have the discretion to look at that defendant in a record and decide what they should have. They've reduced the amount of time we could put probation, people on probation. It used to be we could put them on extended time, particularly it was embezzlements and we had financial crimes. We could put people on probation, make them pay, and hold that over them or go to jail. Well, they've lessened the time we can do that. Um, and they created this matrix. They, they talk about they want to reform the criminal justice system, make it simpler and truthful. This is the matrix for probation. Nobody I know, no probation officer, the judges, there's no lawyer I know can figure this out. <laughs> we find out that people have absconded for six months, just left, and nobody's filed a probation warrant. And we've also found, can you, you, can you probation officer file a warrant on this person who absconded? They go, well, we have to, to go to our supervisor, then we have to go to our regional supervisor. And that could take up to six weeks. That's not the way it used to work. I like the old non-reform system where somebody violated probation, the officer went to the judge and said, this is what they've done. The judge brought them in, they got a lawyer, had a hearing, and the judge decided what to do, and if they wanted to appeal it, they could. Now we have all these administrative processes, they call it the matrix, and, uh, and again, we'll, sometimes when they finally get a violation work, we find out they've actually done four or five violations that didn't require them to file a warrant. And this is the new system, it's leniency. And what I didn't, another slide I didn't show you because we've got limited time, was that the number of cases of violations up and up and up until last year and they go down. Well, the people that are under the system, they're gonna declare victory. But that's not, what, I mean, if you arrest people less, you lower the bar for success for probation and you raise the bar for filing a violation, you're going to have less people violating probation. But does that mean they're committing less crimes and they're being more adherent and they're being rehabilitated? No. What it means is that we're just giving people more leniency and I think it's counterproductive because some of these people need the structure to rehabilitate. They need to know they have to do these things if they want to be productive citizens. And that's part of this criminal reform package that I oppose and I don't think it's effective. Um, but we have it, and it's in place. And I'm going to show you part, this, part two of this next. Do you all know Debbie Locke? I know many of you, you know, her husband, Mike Locke, was killed by a drunk driver. Well, we're supposed to have truth in sentencing, and she wrote an editorial last Sunday, said parole is a privilege and not a right. Well, I wish that was the case. I'm going to show you the law that was passed last year, the criminal reform package for parole, that came from the governor. Here we go. It requires the Board of Parole to consider granting parole for a prisoner who reaches 
the release of eligibility, who has active detainer, blah, blah, blah. What that means is if somebody commits a crime in North Carolina and in Tennessee, it used to be they'd serve all their time in Tennessee, then they'd go over to North Carolina and do their time. Well, now we're saying, well, when they get to a certain point, we're just going to send them to North Carolina. We're going to save money. And Judge Goodwin will verify this, and he said, I wish there was a way I could understand, people that are not in the system could understand, but a lot of what this do is doing is pushing the cost to another state or from the, the state to the county. And I'll give you an example. A few years ago, we had another reform package. It used to be if you committed a crime and you stole over $500, for example, it was a felony. That means it was a state sentence. The state had to pay for your incarceration. Well, they changed the law to theft over $1,000, now a felony. So all the thieves get $500 extra dollar bonus before they become a felon. So all those people that used to go to state custody are now called county prisoners. Well, who's paying for that? You are, right? They're in the county jail, and it's your duty. So a lot of this, part of this is, I think, wishful thinking, ideology, thinking that we pamper people and they're going to improve. But part of it is finances, pushing costs from the state down to the county. And this is an example. Um, Go next slide. And this is one of the worst right here. It used to be, and I go to a lot of parole hearings. I went to one yesterday, and I'll talk to you about that. It used to be it was the defendant had to prove that he was a good candidate for parole. The burden of proof was on the prisoner to show, I've reformed myself, and I should be released from prison. Not anymore. There's some exceptions, but most of the laws now say it's on me to prove they shouldn't get out of jail. <coughs> you see the difference? It used to be they had to prove they were good. Now I have to prove that they're, they're basically the presumption is we're going to turn them loose and get them out of jail and save some money but unless I come in and counter that. And it used to be that I could come in and say the seriousness of this offense is such that's enough to deny this guy probation, um, parole. For example, yesterday I had a case. A man in Bristol, he, he raped a woman, he just met her, got her in a car, drove her down to a field, raped her, took her money, ran over her five times, left her for dead, and she somehow miraculously survived, crawled up to the Volunteer Parkway naked, and gave a statement, and we got, uh, found the guy in California after he raped somebody there, and we found out that five days before he'd raped a woman and left her for dead in the same way in Washington County, Tennessee. So I go to the parole board, and luckily, under the old law, which I was under because of when this crime was, I said, his act is so heinous and so evil, that that's enough. I don't care how many programs in the jail he's gone to, don't care what he's done, don't care what he says, that crime is so bad, that man should not be out in the public. Okay? Well, under the new law, that's not enough. I have to find other reasons to deny the heinousness of the crime itself is not enough. The seriousness of this crime is not enough. And now, also, everybody gets a year off their sentence right here. Mandatory reentry program. That means everybody now gets a year cut off their sentence. And the, pro the parole officer is supposed to meet with them and create a, re a transitional reentry plan. So what's that mean? We're going to have a flood of people getting out of jail a year earlier than what the victims thought. You know, you went to jail, you know, you were a victim, and I go to you and I say, he pled 10 years. He's got to serve 10 years at 30%, which means next to nothing. If you look at that chart I got you, I've handed out there. But what happens when you find out they cut a year off his sentence? Now he's got a nine year sentence. How do you feel as a victim? Is that the direction we want to go as a state? I'll leave that for you all to decide. My answer is no. Next. Here's another law that was passed last year, part of the reform. They changed the definition, as you may know, uh, to, to give someone the death penalty, they have to have a certain IQ. If they're below that, they're ineligible. Tennessee has had a standard in place forever that was approved by the U.S. Supreme Court and the Tennessee Supreme Court. Last year, they changed the standard for the death penalty. That means everybody on death row is going to now file and have and say, I want to be reevaluated because I was reevaluated under the old system. 
And I'll give you how this affects me right off. Mark Vance was murdered by Nicholas Johnson. He was a police officer. He's still on appeal. He's going to be in appeal probably 10 more years. I don't know if I'll even, I might die before he gets through his appeals. But when he gets through all the appeals he's got, and if they finally say you're getting the death penalty, he's going to immediately, the first thing he's going to do is file a motion and say, you know what? My lawyer didn't have me tested under the, uh, this new standard. I want to be reevaluated. And they'll go out, somebody will find an expert somewhere from Harvard or somewhere, and they'll come in and say, his IQ is not high enough, and he should have never gotten the death penalty. And, I, and if you say, that won't ever happen, next slide. It's already happened. Guy got two sentences for the death in Memphis, and they retested him, and guess what? He's not eligible for the death penalty. And guess what? He's eligible for parole in five years. He went from death to be getting out in five years. Is that fair? Is that right to the families of the, the person that was murdered? Is that reform? Is that the direction we want to go? I say no. Next slide. But I want to, I, 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 there were some good things the legislature did. They increased the punishment for trafficking. They increased the punishment for a whole bunch of child abuse charges to make them day for day 100% cases. So some good things they did. They increased the punishment for some child abuse cases. Next slide, you will see that they allowed victims to get an order of protection for life so every year they don't have to go back and renew and renew and renew to keep a bad guy from coming around them. So there were some things they did good, but there were some things they did bad, in my opinion. And I will say, our local legislators were opposed to this reform. So you should give them a pat on the back. Don't criticize them. Say, Stavis, you know, he got me fired up. I'm going to get after you. Matter of fact, they opposed these things. But they weren't the majority. They were the minority. So now I want to talk about next year. What's coming up, or I should say now, this year? I want to show you some bills. And the first one is one that I proposed, uh, along with Gene Perrin, my deputy, uh, you have to mandatory report child abuse, right? If you know a kid's got been abused or neglected, you have to report it, right? If you know an elder person is abused, you have to report it. What happens if you know a doctor or a nurse or a dentist or a podiatrist or a, a, or a medical person is diverting drugs? Your loved one's in a nursing home. Your loved one's in a hospital and they're supposed to get in a drug and instead that person steals it, takes it away, they don't get it, and they suffer pain. Or they divert the drugs that are high, and they're supposed to be treating you, or performing surgery, or performing services in a hospital. Well, right now, the medical ballot and, and the administration or anybody around them do not have to report it. You wouldn't believe how many diversion cases. We had one case where a guy was diverting, he was convicted, he worked at ballot, he left, after he'd finished his sentence, he promised he'd never go back. He went back to ballot and got employed. Guess what he did? He got back on drugs, and what did he do? Diverted drugs again. Well, we found out about that, not because it was reported. We found out through, somebody, through other means. We think that the medical profession, instead of firing these people, letting them go and go somewhere else, which many of them did, it needs to be reported, and it needs to be reported to the police or to me, and we need to investigate. We need to clean out people that would steal drugs that were meant that are legitimately needed for people in treatment. That's not being done. Uh, John Lundberg is the sponsor of that bill. Next. This is another one I sponsored, and it basically says that when somebody serves, a, this is legal stuff, but I want to make it real quick. When somebody serves a consecutive sentence, for example, you commit one crime, you get out of jail and you commit another crime, the law says if one's a 10-year sentence, another 10-year sentence, you're supposed to finish the 10-year sentence and start the next one. Well, we have a law right now that says, no, the Department of Correction can decide when that second sentence serves. They can start it immediately. In other words, they're reducing, they're comp compacting the sentences and reducing them to save money and getting people out of jail. I want that to stop. It should go by what the judge says and what we tell the victim and what we tell the defendant. There should not be another third party getting to contradict what we announced in court and what the defendant agreed to or what the jury imposed or what the judge imposed. Next, again, Debbie, you know, we've had four, speaking of parole, she's had four parole hearings since Mr. Ham has been, well, or the fourth is going to be the 15th, the day after Valentine's Day. 
we're going to go back for the fourth time on a um, 14-year sentence. He was supposed to serve 30% before he was eligible for parole. He hadn't even hardly gotten sentenced before he got his first parole hearing. Well, luckily, somebody passed a, is going to is sponsor the law that will fix that. If somebody does what Mr. Ham did to Mr. Locke, they'll get a 100% sentence. They won't get parole. They'll have to serve a whole sentence. Right now, Mr. Ham served half of his sentence. And there's probably a pretty good likelihood the parole board's going to turn him loose. Even though I'll be there and she'll be there, we'll be fighting it tooth and nail. This is another one that bothers me. <clears throat> Before 1995, a life sentence meant you were eligible for parole after 25 years. You remember Nathan Callahan? He's the guy, he was a young man, high school student. His parents told him to put up his car. He had, uh, he had uh, violated his curfew, their rules. He went home and waited for his mom and his sister to come home and he killed both of them without any remorse, okay? Under the old law, he's eligible for parole. Well, he's already had his first parole hearing. He's up for another one in next year because that's what they do. It used to be you, had, you could wait as far as 10 years for parole hearing. Now, it's the max is six. But now what they're doing is every year or two, a victim's having to come back and tell their story in a post parole, okay? So after Nathan Callahan, they changed the law and said, guess what? First degree murder, 51 years day for day. Then you can ask for parole. That's really a life sentence. I mean, even if you're 20 years old and you have to wait 50 years, you're about 70, right, before you come up pro. Well, guess what? The legislature wants to go back to 25 years, and they want to make it retroactively applied. So think about all the people I told them. You don't have to worry about a pro hearing. You never have to come back. You can try to, I know you can't forget it, but maybe you can process it, get some closure, move on with your life, and not have to worry to ever see that guy, go to a pro hearing, and tell your story, and beg and plead that some parole officer or group uh, the panel won't turn him over back into society. Well, the legislature, and it's not, I, I don't think it's going to pass, thank goodness. We have fought it, district attorneys, police agencies, yeah. but they're wanting to go back and make it to 25 years and you're back, you can ask for parole and get out on a murder case. And finally, another criminal reform package. It's, I didn't, it's 33 pages. But basically, it wants to lower the punishment for all the crimes, and it still wants to give good crime credit for everybody, so it's not truth in sentencing. And that's what I passed around to you. Do you see that paper? If you just glance at it, that's what an average defendant in prison gets, can get credit for. He can get up to 70 days in a, in a month. Is that truth in sentencing? Is that fair to the victims? Is that fair to society? Is that the kind of reform we want? Will that deter crime? Will that make us a safer community? I say not. So there's a lot of things that I wanted to present to you that's been heavy on my chest, and, and you are a group that represent the community, and I wanted to tell you about it. And I know I've probably overrun my time, and I'm sorry if I've bored anybody, if I've, uh, uh, my tone, but I have a sense of urgency about it. I, I, I meet victims every day, and I fight for them, and my office does, and to know that somebody may take somebody that had 51 years to be gone and try to reduce that to 25 and put them back on the streets, um, it, it enrages me. 